Hey family, and welcome to episode 19 of a Critical Sense Making Sessions facilitated by yours truly, Revolutionary Rika. Today's topic is health disparities among minorities. Today's guest is Rashonda Thompson. She is a Bay Area native who is passionate about family, helping others, and financial literacy and health advocacy. Rashonda, tell us a little bit more about who you are and choose one word to describe how you're showing up. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here today um, and to be part of something you're doing is very amazing. Um, like she said, my name is Rashonda Thompson. I am a nurse. I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, half of my time, I grew up in San Francisco. So I consider myself a San Francisco native as well. And um, I also lived the other half of my, well, majority of my life has been in the East Bay. Um, I am a public health nurse. I am a mother to four children. Um, what else? Anything that you want to share? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm a mother to four children, and um, and you know, I just I love what I do, and educating families and educating children. I, I mainly work with um, uh, first time moms in our program. There's family partnership. It's a partnership. Uh, it's a program for first time moms, and it gives me a a lot of room to provide education to families or under underserved and underprivileged families. So I love what I do. I love nursing and that's just me. Oh, well, thank you again for agreeing to come mm -hmm. on and just um, talk a little bit about um, health disparities among minorities and share some of your story. So we appreciate okay. you. We're going to jump right in. So our first kind of icebreaker question is what has been your guilty pleasure during the pandemic? <laughs> My guilty pleasure has actually been it. I'm not going to say it's guilty because it's, it, the, the one thing about the pandemic is it's shown me another side of myself. Mm -hmm. So my thing now is DIY and I love the, I've pretty much remodeled my whole house. I've done my floors. I've done cabinets. Mm -hmm. I've done anything that I would have paid somebody to do. Mm -hmm. And since I had time and my kids put me on to YouTube and that's my guilty pleasure is YouTube because okay. it's getting me in trouble because I keep seeing things that I want to do and yes. more projects on top of more projects. But DIY is definitely my guilty pleasure. Now. Yeah, and, and, I, I've been, and I would not have thought that. And I've been following you um, when you post your <laughs> floors and those different projects, the mm -hmm. backyard. I think you did your fire the fire pit in the backyard and some other stuff uh -huh. that I saw. And I was like really impressed, really impressed. <laughs> and I haven't, even did, I haven't even shown my pictures from the house yet. So those are to come, so. Wow, awesome, you know, amazing soon. work. But well, it, gonna... it, it, what it did was it showed me that there was another side to me that I didn't know I had. So, mm -hmm. and you know, I always, I always say my, my motto is you, you're not living if you don't learn something new every day. And so this it. has showed me, oh, I can do this. I actually enjoy it and yeah. things that I normally would not have done. So yeah. yeah, so with the pandemic that has shown me, that's my new guilty pleasure, I guess. I love it. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> Awesomeness. So I'm going to move us into our first set of questions. And okay. the first one is, tell us a little bit about life growing up in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. Um, growing up in San Francisco, there's nothing like growing up in San Francisco. You know, everyone says says that about their city, but there's nothing like growing up in San Francisco, at least when we grew up in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell my kids now that I call them sheltered because they don't get to do the things that we used to do. Mm -hmm. Me and my cousins, we used to jump on our bikes and we'd be gone all day. Mm -hmm. We'd be able to ride all over San Francisco. We lived in Bayview. And so we were, we would be all the way over in um, Fillmore or, you know, anywhere miles and miles away, we would just jump on our bikes and go. And back then, even though San Francisco was really big, it's really small. So you always ran into someone you knew. And if you were out doing something you weren't supposed to be doing, you hear somebody, I'm telling your mama, yeah. or you know, you're not supposed to, or, you know, they discipline us mm -hmm. and you don't have that anymore today. You know, we didn't have to come back to eat because there was always a rec that was open that had the lunch programs. Yeah. If you wanted to play, you go into the rec, you didn't have to pay, you just went in. 
sign, sometimes you signed in or sometimes they was like, come on in because you knew it was a safe place. And we played games and sports and all types of things that kids don't have access to anymore. And it's sad and they wonder why the kids today are in so much trouble because you've taken all of their outlets. Mm. With us, we were always doing something positive and always doing something, um, you know, exercise wise, or we weren't at home playing video games or in front of the TV screen. And we were always outside until the lights went, came on. Then that's when you knew you had to be back in the house. Right. So there, you know, growing, growing up in San Francisco, you know, we had freedom, you know, we had, and we felt safe. We didn't have to worry about going somewhere and something happening to us, mm -hmm. going some, and, you know, even if the adults didn't know this, know us, they protect the children. Absolutely. So, and I'm, and I'm like that to this day, you know, I tell my neighbors, if I'm outside, you don't have to worry about your kid because I'm watching them. I'm watching them as long as, just like I'm watching my kids. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't get that anymore. These mm -hmm. days, um, no one wants you to discipline your, their kids or talk to their kids, even if you're telling them right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I miss that about, about growing up in San Francisco. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. That brings back <laughs> so many memories, like mm -hmm. being at the pier or all mm -hmm. over Cal Palace exactly. or wherever we were. Um, wherever we were at. We don't know how, how we got that far, but you exactly. know, we, we just got on our BMXs and, and went. So before Dora was an explorer, we was exploring the city. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love it, I love it. So thinking back on your childhood, um, what health disparities existed in your family? When I was a child, I didn't, you know, I didn't really notice health disparities because, you know, we were kids. We ate what we would, what we would put on our plate. And at least in my family, we didn't talk about it, but I didn't re realize it until we grew, I saw grew up, you know, right now is like diabetes and high blood pressure and things like that. And, but when you're a kid, you don't see all those things. You just, it's like, oh, um, you know, what's wrong with grandma or what's wrong with great grandma or something like that. And they, they'll say something about it, but then you don't understand it. And mm -hmm. they were just like, you know, back then, unfortunately it was, you know, it's grown folks business. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get enough of the information that we should have gotten mm -hmm. to kind of make a change in mm -hmm. our lives as an adult. It's interesting you mentioned that because um, I was talking with someone a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the whole idea of a child should be seen and not heard. And mm -hmm. in that process, what we do is we, we disempower them to speak up in situations because they haven't had practice. They haven't had a chance. Exactly. And where do you get that practice at home? So I'm glad exactly. that you mentioned that. Yeah, I tell my kids, they can tell me whatever they need to tell me. If they want to disagree with me, they're more, they can disagree with me. They, they don't have to, they don't have to, do whatever I have to say, unless, you know, as of course there's certain circumstances, but we can have a conversation about it. It's not about what you tell me, it's how you tell me. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you come to me, whether you agree with me or not, or you have a problem with something I did, come, come to me with a respectful tone and mm -hmm. we can have a conversation about it. I didn't have that growing up. So I wanna make sure that my, and that's why I'm, you know, one of my big things is advocacy because you can't teach your kids to be an advocate if they can't advocate against yourself, against you as a parent. Absolutely, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, how did your family educate you and equip you to avoid unhealthy habits? <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, especially with Thanksgiving just coming around, mm -hmm. you know, there was the ham and there was, and I'm guilty, I still cooked it because even though I don't eat it myself, I still have family members that eat it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everything was grease or something, something that was healthy was made unhealthy, like the greens. You added all these extra seasonings and fat and things like that to something that was supposed to be healthy. So therefore it wasn't healthy, but that's all we knew. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, that's what we ate. And we, we felt, okay, we're eating vegetables, so they're healthy. But when you add all that extra to it, no, it's no longer healthy. Mm -hmm. So I guess now I'm more of the health advocate in the family <laughs> because just because I've learned mm -hmm. just because I know. So things that like, I get a lot of, I get a lot of flack sometimes depending on who I'm talking to. Cause I've, I've 
change my eating habits. So now I'm pescatarian. Mm. You don't meet too many people of color that say they're pescatarian and vegetarian and vegan and things like that. So it's kind of foreign when you hear someone of color say that they're one of those things. Mm -hmm. But it's just that when growing up, we're not we're not exposed to that. It's no, that's always the white thing or something like mm -hmm. that. When no, it's a health thing. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna if you want to do something, get rid of some of those um health adverse ad, adversities, adversaries, I'm sorry, um, that you grow up with, then you have to make a change. Just like they say, oh, diabetes runs in my family, high blood pressure runs in my family. That's true. However, the main culprit that runs in your family yeah. are your eating habits and your diet. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have a whole line of family members who are diabetic or have high blood pressure. But if you watch your diet, there's a chance that you won't that you won't develop it in a lot and that's what we have to teach our our young people today is that you don't have to be subjected to what your your elders have right now because you have a choice and you have and you have um how can i say you you have more more you have more choices and you have more education on what you should and shouldn't be eating okay um, how did your school educate you and equip you to avoid unhealthy habits? It, well, I guess you could say they really didn't. Uh, you know, we went to school together, so you knew what, what we were buying and there was always Pizza Hut or something like that. I think I think the only thing, the only difference about schools now when it comes to the lunch program than it did when we were growing up is that everything was made right then and there. It wasn't mm -hmm. packaged and brought in. Cause I used to be a school nurse. Mm -hmm. And even though they had kitchens in the schools, they weren't cooking the food. The food was brought in from a, a main location. It was bought in in wrappers. And, and I look at the food and I will look at the food and I'm like, why are they feeding this to our children? But they want our children to be healthy. And, mm -hmm. you know, things were overcooked or didn't look appetizing at all. And it's like, especially in the lower um economic schools mm -hmm. you know they they got the the worst of it and it was and it was it's disheartening that this is what you want to feed our children but you want you're talking about you want to give them the best of what um to the best start or to um you know give give them something that they don't have mm -hmm. but you're just basically giving them what you wouldn't want mm -hmm. It's interesting you point that out. I was working for a private school for almost a decade and a affluent private school. And lunch was like, mm -hmm. I mean, it was always fancy. It was fresh. It mm -hmm. was, uh, I feel like Epicurean was using China. They were using real. Mm -hmm. um, and when I looked at the kids that I was working with just down in the Western edition, it was like what you it just said. It was totally said. different. It was mm -hmm. stuff that most kids are throwing away. They're not going to mm -hmm. eat. And so it's You're interesting right. that even though I understand that the private school was paying like a lot of money to mm -hmm. go there. And so that's what, that was part of the cost, but mm -hmm. like just 10 block difference that's in Pacific Heights and mm -hmm. just down in, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. Rosa Parks, they're getting this food that they, most mm -hmm. kids are not touching unless right. they just don't have access. Mm -hmm. and, and my kids, they went to school, they went to high school in Piedmont. Mm -hmm. And you of course know, um, Piedmont is, is a very affluential neighborhood. And I would be like, okay, well, what's lunch and things like that? Where you first, my kids were taking lunch, and then they were like, I don't want that. They want what was the school was given. I'm like, since when do you want what the school was given? They would have, they had a variety. It wasn't what one day you had pizza and that was it. Right. They either they could they had a, a fresh salad bar if you want a salad. They had a sushi bar. They had hot food. So they had a choice of what they wanted to eat, and it was freshly made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, when kids are in high school, they want to eat what their friends are eating, even though what they were bringing from home wasn't that bad, but, you know, they, you know, they wanted to fit in. So, and it wasn't, it wasn't expensive, mm -hmm. you know, like you, like you would think it would be for them, for what they were eating. And it was, quali it was good quality food. And it's interesting you point that out because thinking about that, having quality food and access to quality mm -hmm. food, we know that most kids come to school when they have behavioral issues they haven't eaten or they've been eating junk food. And so that's mm -hmm. offsetting it. And mm -hmm. so just having access to fruits and vegetables, a salad bar, this mm -hmm. fresh food, 
could change the um, environment and change mm-hmm. the learning environment for the young people mm-hmm. who are triggered because they exactly. haven't had quality food. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to work at, um, I don't know if in Oakland, Alameda, I mean, not Alameda, I'm sorry, Allendale. And so mm-hmm. I had a, I had a, sometimes it depends on the principal of the school, the leaders of the school will let you kind of go for, you know, what you want to do. So I had a, I had a, re- a really good principal and I noticed that kids will come come to my office because their stomachs were hurting or you know things and I'm like well what's going on they hadn't had breakfast Mm -hmm. and so I made it to I would go to the store Costco and and stack up on things for breakfast and they would come to my my office for breakfast or sometimes they were eating uh for breakfast they would stop at the store get some hot Cheetos or Mm -hmm. something and a soda and then they would be in my office with a stomach ache because that's what they had for breakfast so I was able to actually ban all that stuff from schools from our school because the principal was like you know if that's what you need to do but once you know once the kids knew they stopped bringing that stuff to school and you know sometimes they would have you would have parents bringing in a whole pizza and a two liter soda for their lunch i'm like no you can't that's if, if that's for to share with the class okay but not for one lunch so yeah. sometimes it was more educating the parents but, but you have to educate it educate the parents through the students mm-hmm. So we had health clubs and health fairs and things like that to where it's, it was rewarding because, you know, you get to see these kids and learning about different fruits and vegetables that they didn't, and fresh fruits and vegetables that they probably didn't have access to or didn't know about Mm -hmm. and learning new things and cooking new things to know, okay, healthy foods are good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing out Mm -hmm. a lot of great tips. So what prompted you to pursue a career path in the medical field? Um, I guess I kind of fell into it. I always believe that things happen to you in this, um, in this life for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so with mine, it was my older two. They were, um, ones right here. Um, so when I was pregnant with them, I delivered them at 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so they were in the hospital for about three months. And I, me, I always need as a parent, not just as a parent, but as a person, I'm always curious about what things go on. So when they were in a NICU, you know, the bells would go off or, you know, they wanted to have procedures. And I'm like, nope, if you're going to do a procedure, I'm going to be right there just because, you know, I'm going to be there to support my child. But they noticed that I wasn't afraid. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the nurses that were there and, you know, to, you know, we always say that there, I always believe that, you know, there are people of not our color that are, you know, they are beneficial in our life. So all the nurses that were there, there weren't any black nurses in the NICU. And so the nurses that I was talking to, they were Caucasian, but they were really nice. And they advocated for me like, you know, this is something that you can do. I'm like, I'm like, I can't do this. This is not for me. But that was just me know dealing with that stereotype this is not what I can do this is not meant for us you know this is not it's going to be hard for me and this and they're like no you can you can do this you have that mindset to do it and so I thought about it and then I was like okay well I'll think about it and so after I'm sorry so after after they came home you know, I tried to stay at home mom. I can't do that. I am, you know, I give a lot of credit to those moms who can be a stay at home mom or a parent or even stay at home dad. But six months, I was like, okay, well, let me give this health thing a, a try. And so I ended up being a medical assistant and to see if, you know, that was the field I want. And I absolutely loved it. And so after that, after my second daughter was born, I said, if I don't, cause I kept saying, I'm gonna go back to school. I'm gonna go back to school. And then after she was born, I said, if I don't go back to school now, I'm not going to go back to school. So I ended up going back to school um, and I graduated with a bachelor's from Samuel Merritt University. And I also noticed that, you know, out of Samuel Merritt University, I think there were only three people of color in our class. There were three people of color and one man in our class of 45, 50 people. And so I was like, okay, so this is, this is how it's going to be. And so throughout my whole career, or throughout my whole um, schooling, the only thing I wanted to do, I had tunnel vision. I said, I'm just going to be a NICU nurse because that's all I knew was NICU nurse. I kept telling everyone, I'm going to be a NICU nurse. I'm going to be a NICU nurse. I even got the program to, 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 a separate program to be in, to do the NICU. 
Um, Cause I knew I like working, I knew that cause that's all I knew, but I also like working with kids. And so I went through there, but as I went through each, um, each clinical and each section of nursing, my interest changed. And so my last, uh, I think my last rotation was public health. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely love public health. And the one thing I lo- loved about public health was that you're able to provide the education and you can actually see the change in, in that person. So with n- regular nursing, you know, nothing against regular nursing, you know, it's, it's not for everybody, but it, I loved it, but it wasn't the same because it was like every patient was just a number. You went, you told them what to do, and then you sent them sent them out. But you're you didn't know what was going on in their household. So you uh, so a lot of people come back because the education that is given in the hospital is given off of basic information, but you don't know what they're working with at home. So you're telling them to do A, B, and C, but they don't have the equipment to do B or C. So now they're back in the hospital because, and then you're, you're saying, okay, you didn't follow the instructions that we gave you properly, but you don't, you can't assess their home life because you don't know some people Either they don't have a home or they're renting a room, they're sitting in they're in their couch surfing, things like that. You don't take into account their circumstances. And so they so there's like a rotating door. They keep coming back because they don't have they don't have the equipment or the the ability to do what we've told them to do in the hospital. But being public health, you're able to go out and you're able to assess their living conditions. And you're able to adjust what they need to do based on those living conditions. So when I got into public health, I'm like, this is where I need to be. This is, then this is what I do. This is what I like to do because I like to educate. So that, and that's where I'm at now. And I wouldn't change it. That's what's up. It's interesting. Um, in my field, what I'm, what I'm struggling with around that is in education is us educating children, but not realizing mm-hmm. that we have to educate the whole child. So exactly. if I don't know what home like is like, this, mm-hmm. like that relationship building piece has to come back. That was there. I feel like mm-hmm. when we were in school, mm-hmm. um, I think now it's more focused on testing and mm-hmm. looking at measures. And I'm like, without the relationship piece for a lot of students, they slide through the cracks. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of them end up with health disparities just mm-hmm. because all these things start to connect together, right? Exactly. And, and then and the health disparities is actually something that's new that they're starting to figure out that mm-hmm. if if they're not even if they're not eating healthy if they're not eating at all mm-hmm. then you they're not going to be able to concentrate when they're in school if they haven't had breakfast or you know if they haven't or you know if, if things are going on at home that mm-hmm. or you know didn't have dinner and things like that it's going to affect them in school you know it's it's Absolutely. I was going to say I had a student, we, he was in the first grade maybe, and we were doing a literacy survey on him. Mm-hmm. And we were asking him like, what motivates him to read? He's, and he said, sometimes it's too loud. I can't read. And we're like, mm-hmm. so the teacher was like, well, we usually have you in a quiet space by yourself. He was like, yeah, but my stomach is grumbling. Mm-hmm. So that sound is like so loud to him because he hasn't eaten. That is exactly the way, you know, him being able to read. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what have you learned about the health disparities that exist in our marginalized communities? Um, I think it's, unfortunately there hasn't, there's been some change, but not enough change. You know, our uh, people of color, our numbers are still too high. You know, it's, and a lot of it, I believe it's, more because we haven't given we, we they don't um, p- people of color don't realize that they have a choice so one thing that i do especially when i'm educating some of my clients is that you have a choice if you don't like your doctor or feel like what your doctor is saying you're able to change you don't have to deal do what if you don't agree with what your doctor is saying then you get a second opinion. You know, if you know, I no one knows your body like you do. Mm-hmm. So if you know it's something that is, that you know is not going to agree with you, or you know, you have to you have to be able to advocate for yourself. 
And so teaching mm -hmm. us how to advocate for ourselves because one, they don't, they don't listen. And what I mean about, I mean, some, 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 I'm not gonna say all, some providers don't listen. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it also is that you have to go in there knowing what you're talking about. You can't go in there spouting off conspiracy theories or you know things that you've heard or other people's opinions. You have to go in there saying, okay, this is what I've learned. And this is, and you know, can you explain that to me to make sure that we're on the same track? You have to, you have to know about your health. If you have high blood pressure, you have to know that 120 over 80 is just a standard. That's not your standard. You need, you need to know your own baselines of all of your labs and things like that. So if you go in and say, okay, my the the med tech takes your blood pressure, and if you're usually like I'll use mine, my blood pressure is usually like 90 over 60 or somewhere around there. Now, if I go in and all of a sudden it's 110 over 82, and I'm like, okay, that's high for me. And I'm like, oh no, it's normal. It's, it's still within range. I'm like, but that's not a range. That's not my range and teaching. And so then they're like, and that, that makes them go look in the computer and say, oh, okay. Yeah. You're usually are lower than that. So letting them know that, you know, you, what you're talking about, know your numbers and know, know your own health and the health and also the health of your children that makes you a stronger advocate and they'll they'll they're more inclined to listen to you because you are taking you taking that power back from them they can't tell you what to do like for for example when um like i said earlier my children were premature at 24 weeks and my um my my gyn has that, you know, they're 24 weeks, there's going to be a chance that they're going to have some mental issues, they're going to have some physical issues. He, he said all the things that would scare someone who was 21 having twins. To, to, to he said the best thing for you to do is to abort them. And I'm like, well, why would I do that? Because he felt he felt that that was the best thing to do. As, as me being a youth and not thinking that if they did have some issues and things like that, I wouldn't be able to um, to handle it. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, you don't know me like that. You don't know what I can handle. I don't even know what I can handle until I'm doing it. Yeah. So after they were born, you know, I probably three months later, I went and showed them uh, and he was he was amazed. He was like, you know, I'm like, see, this is what you thought I should have boarded. it should have should have aborted and my kids now they're 22 and and without an issue you know besides the, the typical teenage and the young adult issues but you know they had they had some some growing they did have some some developmental at the in, uh, issues in the beginning but we got resources and things like that to catch them up to where they were supposed to be and that's another thing that we as a people of color we are not we're so focused on people being in our business that we don't get those resources like we should that's going to help us. Yeah. And so my that's why my thing is, you know, you have to be able to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I um I'll just share a quick story. I um had an issue with Kaiser and um my doctor would not I kept saying I have these back issues, they're not going away. And I know that I've had some of that from sports from mm -hmm. early on. But this was different. And it took me six months. She kept sending me home, giving me gabapentin, all this stuff that mm -hmm. wasn't working. And so I had to go around her and mm -hmm. literally send. And this is when um, Bernard Tyson was still alive. May you rest in peace. But mm -hmm. I had to inbox him on LinkedIn to get somebody to do something because I was emailing and going through their mm -hmm. channels. Nothing was happening. When mm -hmm. I emailed him on LinkedIn, I got an email from Kaiser within three hours. Mm -hmm. And then they finally said, okay, we're going to give you an MRI and all these things come to find out I had two herniated discs, mm -hmm. um, pinch nerve, and it was getting worse because she wasn't treating. doing anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that I stayed the course and advocated mm -hmm. like, like you talked right. about, because most of the times we'll do what they say and go home and get worse. And then it's no fix for the problem. Exactly. And the same thing here is like with my, I think with me, it's a little bit different because they know I'm a nurse. So they give me a little bit more credit, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which is sad because, you know, people know their bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter, she, um, I mean, I, I, before I didn't, I wasn't a big Kaiser fan, but now I love Kaiser. But mm -hmm. with Kaiser, you have to know how to advocate through. Mm -hmm. If you know how to advocate for yourself, Kaiser is amazing. 
So my daughter, she's torn both her ACLs and I was always, I always go through and pick the doctor. I don't just give, get what particular one I've gone through and pick. So I've gotten lucky. I've gotten some, well, I've done my homework and I've gotten some really good doctors. Whenever she gets hurt um, playing, playing basketball or something, we go and I call, I'm able to call, she had a pediatric orthopedist, which I never knew existed. I just thought oh. orthopedist was an orthopedist. And so I found a pediatric orthopedist and he would get her in within a week. She tore her ACL. She had, she had her MRI in less than a week. And it's just because I was able to advocate. I'm like, we know what's going on. She has this, this, and this. And I would just email, he's like, okay, we'll order an x-ray, we'll order this, her MRI is this day. And just because I had that conversation, I was having those conversations and, and open communication with the doctor. So, I mean, even though I'm, you know, because I'm in the medical field, I know, I know what language to use, mm -hmm. but you don't have to know medical terminology to be able to advocate for yourself. Just know what you're talking about and just know that don't go and they're angry and accusatory because then they're not, they're definitely not going to listen to you. Right. You know, you, you like with you, you were like, okay, this is what's going on. You didn't get the, the stereotypical angry black woman. You just went a, around that person, which you can do. And a lot of people don't, don't realize that you just go around the person who's blocking you and you yeah. figure out who is above that person and then you go to that person. Yeah. And so, yeah, so just continue to advocate for yourself and your family and, so I think if every, we can educate everyone on how to do that properly, a lot of our disparities, our numbers wouldn't be so high. I'm not saying it's not gonna be there, it will be there, but we'll have a lot more people who can, who can bring those numbers down. And so how do you advocate for your patients who have health disparities? Um, we, so with, with me, I, we have, when we have clients, we talk about their issues. We'll talk about their um, whatever, if you have a seizure disorder, if you have mental health issues, if you have gestational diabetes, things like that. First, we educate, you know, what does this mean? Make sure you know what your, what your diagnosis means and what it means for you. And then once we figure that out, okay, let's, let's, um, let's what did the doctor say that your course of, of um, action is? And then we follow that. And if you're not either, if you're not understanding, or if you're not, um, if you're not comfortable with it, then we have another conversation with it. I'm like, okay, well, this is what you need to say to your doctor. So teaching them and giving them a script on how to talk to their providers and how to disagree without being angry or how to disagree appropriately with your doctor um, to make sure that they continue to listen to you and making sure that they know that you know what you know what you're talking about. If you have all the information on on um, on um, that health issue, like for example, it's if I have a mom who's going to call the doctor. Being in, working in a, an office, I already know what the doctor wants to know. So I say before you call, because a lot of moms or a lot of people will call the doctor and not have any information on mm -hmm. why, and they can't make a, if they're doing a phone um, visit or something like that, they can't give you a diagnosis or can't treat you if you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if you know you haven't been feeling well, how long have you, the one thing you should know is how long have you been feel, not feeling well? Okay, I haven't been feeling well for three or four days. And what are your symptoms? I've been having... I've been, I've been dizzy. I've been having um, difficulty breathing. I've been, I've had a cough. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you've had a cough and you're coughing up, are you coughing up? Is it a dry cough? Is it a wet cough? And you know, what do you mean by that? A dry cough, nothing comes out. A wet cough means you have some, some speed no more phlegm and all that. And they say, okay, well, I've had some phlegm. Okay. Well, what color is it? You know, and you go down the line, you go down the line. I'll say, okay, now, and have you had a fever and everything that you've had, you should write it down because the doctor's going to ask you these things. Mm -hmm. And then when you call the doctor, you already have all these answers for them. So you make one, you make their job a lot easier and you you make them, they don't have to, they don't have to dig deep as far as how much information and what's going on. Okay. You have an upper respiratory infection. We're going to give you um, some antibiotics. And this is what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a cough suppressant, a decongestant or something like whatever their course of treatment would be. And then that, 
30 minute frustrating phone call for the doctor can be five or 10 minutes that, okay, and then you can, within that 30 minutes, you can have your medication or you can have your treatment plan. Mm -hmm. So that's what, by educating them on how to advocate for themselves and how to talk to their doctor will make things a lot easier on both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's some great tips. So how does society contribute to health disparities among minorities? Um, society, I think that's a, that's a tricky one because with society, so many people have their, have different ideas of what health is and what health disparities are. You have people who are like, okay, well, you shouldn't be eating meat or you shouldn't be eating dairy or you should, it's, it's, everyone has their opinions. I, I think if we can just come and get a general thing of what health should look like for everybody, um, it's not just a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. I think just by making sure that, I think education is the number one thing. If we can just mm -hmm. educate our communities on things that are helpful or, like, like for instance, you no. Know, if you go in the East Oakland, how many grocery stores are in East Oakland? Right. Exactly. How many uh, how many liquor stores are in East Oakland? Right. And then, and another thing that some of the liquor stores are doing is they're putting grocery store on there, grocery and liquor or something, and they're putting a little bit of produce in there to say that they are a grocery store. But if you go in there, the produce they've had, they probably went and got from somewhere else and it's been sitting there for forever because who wants to buy mm -hmm. produce from a liquor store? Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at the access that um, minorities or those who are underprivileged have. They don't have, they have to, how far do they have to go to get groceries? How far, I think in East Oakland, I can just see this. I, there's probably maybe five in all of East Oakland. And, you know, they had, they did put the um, Whole Foods there, but a lot of people from East Oakland can't afford to shop at, at Whole Foods. Right. You know, right. I go to Whole Foods and half of my basket is full and that's a small one and I've spent almost $100. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us can't afford to, um, to go to stores like that, you know, Safeway and then, um, actually, I don't even think that, no, there is one safely in East Oakland, but it's in a, it's up in the hills. So if you're in deep East Oakland, you're not going to have, you're going to have to travel to get quality food. And a lot of us don't have cars. Yeah. So I think bringing in, bringing in um, um, those, bringing in those things that they need to make it more, even if it has to be like a pop-up farmer's market or in, in a parking lot or things like that to give them the chance to get um, quality foods and, and things. I think that would definitely help in teaching them that, okay, these are foods that are healthy. These are foods that you know we need. It doesn't always have to be a candy bar, a bag of chips and a, a soda. You know, we can get fresh fruit. We can get, um, you know, things that doesn't have to come in a can, you know, just giving, exposing them to new things and exposing them to those fresh, fresh foods and things like that will give a lot of, um, a lot of power back to the, to the people of color. So I'm glad you shared that because so many of our communities are, um, are sitting in food deserts and mm -hmm. One, like you said, they don't have access or the food that they do have access to is not quality. And so right. um, I was, um, one of my professors works for, or he helps to build Homies Empowerment in East Oakland. Mm -hmm. And they do a pantry mm -hmm. one day a week. And ever since the pandemic, they've been doing a pantry and a giveaway where people can come in who don't have food. It's for free mm -hmm. and they can shop and they can get, they can take whatever they need. And so it's, right. it's on them, right? And so if you want mm -hmm. more because you need more, then get it. But understanding too that there's so many other people in need at this time too. Exactly. Um, and so I, I've just been really trying to connect with more organizations that are doing some of those things so that I can mm -hmm. share those resources because they do have access to kind of mm -hmm. vegetables and fruit. Whereas, right. and just food right now with, with that being a shortage. I know the food banks mm -hmm. are running out daily. So right. yeah. But then they also got, you also got to remember, you know, 
people of color, they have a lot of pride. And sometimes you got to swallow your pride because yeah. sometimes I've driven past the food banks and you may see two or three of us in that line. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it's like, but you're at home and you don't have any food. I mean, yeah. if I need to, I'm going I'm going to get in that line. You know, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't take away from who you are. Everyone struggles from time to time. Yeah. You know, it doesn't doesn't mean that you're less than, you know, people look down on the poor. And right. we and being poor, we look down on ourselves too. Like, oh, I'm not doing that. So you'd rather go hungry right. than stand in a line to get some fresh foods. So right. I think sometimes we have to swallow our pride too. Right. And tap into them resources that's at our fingertips. Exactly. Like it's, that's mm-hmm. advocating for your needs. I don't have food. Okay, I'm going to this exactly. line to get food. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So how have health disparities among minorities been impacted during the pandemic? Um, I think it's, I think it's still the same. It's just because, but now it's more, it's on TV. So the numbers, you see those, the, those disparities, you see the numbers changing and now it's, it's brought into, it's brought into the limelight. It's like, okay, what we already know in the health field is that these, these numbers aren't new for us. Mm-hmm. These disparities aren't new for us. They're new for everyone else because they didn't know, or they, or, you know, sometimes they didn't want to know, mm-hmm. you know, or it's, you know, those that can make those changes, we're turning that blind eye. So now that it's in the news, just like, you know, all the, the things that are happening with people of color being killed and things like that. Now it's in everyone's faces. Mm-hmm. Now you turn on a channel, you turn the TV on, because, you know, turn the channel, the TV on, turn the computer on, turn whatever social media you have on, and it's right there in your face. And so you can't really be ignorant to it because it's there. You know, it's not like, okay, I didn't, oh, I didn't know that. Well, my, Ten, my um, 13 year old knows this because he's on social media and it doesn't even have to be a whole article. Mm-hmm. You sometimes you just see the top, um, the, the article name and that information is inside that name. So even if you don't open it, it's still right there for you to read. If you don't, if you choose not to open it, that means that you choose not to be part of the solution. Right. Absolutely. It's interesting. I know Chadwick Bozeman passed mm-hmm. away this summer. And mm-hmm. so that's why I kind of brought it up, just thinking about, you know, as things come and go, how soon we forget where we've come from. And so I feel like exactly. the health disparities have come up before, but because of mm-hmm. other things come in and overshadow, and then we forget, and then we're here again. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and it's sad, right? And it's sad that it has a. We only put a. A, a microscope on it when it happens to someone who's prominent, when it happens to someone, mm-hmm. someone famous. So we already know prostate cancer is one of the highest, um, or has the highest mortality rate. But now that we've seen someone famous actually die from it, now it's a big thing, but it's mm-hmm. always been a big thing. And it's not just for people of color, but it's higher in people of color because we don't go get checked out. You know, we stay away from the doctors. We stay away from, we don't get our physicals. We only go to the doctors when it's a problem, but why not go to the doctors before it becomes a problem? Get your yearly physical, get your it didn't, it bi-yearly physical, just, you know, as long as you're getting checked up and you're monitoring your health, don't wait until, oh, I haven't been, I've been sick for all oh, so long. Cause even with Chad, Chadwick, he had known for years that he had this and it was just growing and growing, but he was still, he knew it was coming, but he was still able to fulfill his life. Mm-hmm. You know, having, Having issues doesn't mean that it's an automatic death sentence. It just means that now you can have solutions, you can have treatments, and you can and you can you can live your life how you want to. If you know you're not gonna you don't want to do chemo and this is it and you're gonna keep then you know you're gonna live your life to the fullest. If you know you're gonna fight, okay, well what's my next what's my treatment options? But you don't you can't have those options if you don't go and know what you have, what you have going on. Because by then, you, by the time you're feeling it, you might be a stage four. And a stage four is, is really hard to come back from, yeah. you know, or your blood pressure is so high that you're, you can have a stroke at any time. Mm-hmm. So just knowing your, knowing your own health, not just knowing your body, but knowing where your health status is, is important as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And so how can we change health outcomes for communities of color? We need to, we need to have, 
just like we're having open forums on police brutality, we need to have open forums on health disparities as well. We need to have people who are making those, who have the, the power to make decisions and make changes. They need to be at the table as well. We need to have doctors, we need to have nurses, we need to have a community who is being affected, you know, sitting at the table to find out, okay, what can we do? You know, the, mm -hmm. the doctors need to listen to the people and say, this is the problem that we're having when we come to the doctors. This is this is the problem we have accessing treatment. You know, you, you want to give us a treatment and it's not covered by our insurance. And I can't afford seven hundred dollars for a medication. So what's the next treatment? But you want me to, and say I have to have this medication. So now it's like you're not listening to me, so I'm not going to listen to you. And then the cycle keep continues. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have to have a forum that can get something done. That can that can have some type of progress or can can benefit everyone involved. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, so I'm gonna move us into our last part of the conversation. And so share anything you are doing to educate others on the health disparities that exist in communities of color. So I, I think just the profession that I've gone into, the, the, the category that I'm in or the specialty that I'm in is, is public health. And so I'm working in the public health. So I'm working with, like I said, first time moms. So I'm educating those moms on how to have those conversations with their children as they're growing up and, and learn how to advocate and learn how to pass it along. So even when I, even though I can go in, well, when before, um, the pandemic, um, we would go into the house. I wouldn't just educate the my client. I'd educate the whole household. Mm -hmm. You know, if and and then especially when you have when you go into a household of color, you you're going to have an elder there, especially if it's a multi generational household. And the elders there are like, "Yep, see, I've been trying to tell her. I've been trying to tell her, but sometimes, you know, we have to listen and we have to be open and." So just educating, getting in there, educating them and letting them know that they have a voice and most importantly, that they have a voice. Yes. Um, I try and get on as many, if I can't get on a, a, a um, forum that we're having in the, to make changes in, the, um, in our community, I, I'm at least trying to send in information or answer the questions they're asking as far as what can we do? And so I've always tried to be a voice in that. Um, and then just keep just keep doing what I'm doing. That's all I can do is, you know, I can edu only educate those that are willing. And mm -hmm. for every, you know, you don't always get a success story, but even one success story is a lot. You know, I've had a few, but even one success story, you know, you help one family, that one family, you you help that uh, few generations, you know, mm -hmm. and that and that's how you build. You have one family at a time, mm -hmm. and you, you build that, that, that generational um, education and, and foundation. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Have you taken any action to disrupt the health disparities that exist? Um, I think just educating. That's all I can. Right now, that's that's what I can do, and mm -hmm. and that's what I'm I'm good at. So, I mean, until the opportunity, once the opportunity comes, depending on what it is, then, you know, I try and, I try and add my, I guess you could say my two cents into it, <laughs> but, um, you know, just trying to be there and try and make as many changes as I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do you advocate for access to better health care for our most marginalized client citizens? Um, I, I, I do my homework on my resources. So, cause sometimes we can have a lot of resources, but when you go to access them, they're probably gone or you know, they don't have any funding anymore. So just making sure that I'm giving out proper resources and I'm always looking for resources. And also I listen to a lot of my clients because they find resources that I don't have access to or I didn't even know about. And the one thing about our people is that we can be resourceful. We figure out, we always make it happen. We find a way to make it happen and tapping into that to get to get it to where it benefits everybody not just that particular family at that time mm -hmm. i think we we'd be a lot stronger mm -hmm. absolutely and so have you created any resources just to counteract oppression 
Um, not that I'm aware of, but you know, mm-hmm. sometimes just your actions, your everyday mm-hmm. actions that you don't know are helpful. Like I've had people, I still have, I still have um, students, I haven't worked in the school district in years. And so a lot of the kids that I had are, you know, in high school or have graduated, but they still remember what we did in those classes. And they, mm-hmm. and they, they still, they still carry that with them today. Mm-hmm. And so I think just educating one at a time can help build, you know, something it can help get them out of that. Absolutely. So yeah, just, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. It sounds like you planted a lot of seeds. So yeah, that's, that's all we can do. We may not, yes. We may not get to see the flower, but we yes. know that the seeds have been sowed. So yes. that's all I can do. That's right. And you know, sometimes I'm blessed to be able to see that flower, but yes. it's you know, but I know I've given them a good foundation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Rashonda, for sharing your experience and just some of your expertise about the um, health disparities that exist among minorities. I wanted to take the time now to um, just highlight some of the pearls that I heard you say. I heard you say a lot but I'll stick to just a few. Um, One, learn how to navigate and communicate communicate in the medical field. So Mm -hmm. even in your own health journey. Mm -hmm. Um, We need to learn how to advocate for our health needs, which is connected to that one. And then changing our diets can help change our health outcomes. I really like when you um, pointed out just uh, the the way we make greens and Mm -hmm. how we just, you know, Mm-hmm. just barely cook them we would be fine but we right. took all the nutrients out so I like that exactly. you mentioned that and then the other one that stood out for me was just needing to have open forums on health disparities where decision makers and community members work together to discuss what's happening but to mm-hmm. create clear action steps I think that's what we need action I think we have a lot of um, meetings and sessions and exactly. Mm-hmm. A lot but of no data action. on what, but no action. We're, exactly. We're meeting on the meeting that we had about the meeting, about the meeting prior to that. <laughs> right, right. And I'm sick of meeting about meetings. Exactly. So, um, Can we do something now? Absolutely. So again, I want to say thank you for sharing mm-hmm. um, and coming to share on the podcast. And if there's one last piece of advice or tip that you would like to share with the viewers, your voice is the last one that they will hear. I just say, you know stay open to new things because you're not going to change if you're not open to new things. And um, just like with the, just like with the, the, the diet, if you're not willing to try something new, then you're not going to know if you like it or not. So I just say, stay open and be willing to try something new. It, it doesn't even have to be health related, just, and it'll, it'll expand your life tremendously just being open to something new whether it's something that we've done in our history whether it's something we've that that don't be don't stay in the norm don't don't keep yourself in a box the box that you know people of color have kept themselves in for so long because they felt like doing this thing black people don't do that black people don't do this black well black people don't do anything then if they don't want to go out and do other things I've learned doing things that are not typical and not normal for what people of color do mm-hmm. is actually really fun and and different and and I enjoy it and I did I wouldn't have known if I wasn't able to or willing to step out of that box so just step out the box that's my thing all right thank you <laughs>